Good evening. I'm Charlotte Eckhart. I'm the vice chair, uh, the vice dean of the um, Faculty of Dental Surgery of the Royal College of Surgeons, um, and I've been asked to chair this evening. Um, we have a, a lovely panel for us this evening. We've got Ginny Bobrick, Karen um, Chu, Philippa Burns, and Alex Ashman, um, who will be talking to us. Um, about Pride Month. Um, I've been asked to chair this as I sit on the core team for the Royal College of Surgeons and we're involved in the implementation of the um, recommendations from the um, Kennedy Review. And with that, I'll hand you over to Ginny. Hello, I'm Ginny Bowbreak. I'm the chair of PRISM or Pride and Surgery Forum. Um, I'm a vascular surgeon consultant in um, Kent. I'm also head of school of surgery for Kent, Surrey and Sussex, chair of the vascular SAC. Uh, Philippa, Karen, did you want to introduce yourselves? Oh, we're going to start oh, with Got the slide uh, my, name's, <laughs> my name is Philippa Burns. I'm a vascular surgeon in Edinburgh and a member of PRISM. Karen? Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Choi. My pronouns are she and they. Um, I am a SD4 Orthopedic Registrar in London. I am also the BOTA Culture and Diversity Representative and a founding member of PRISM. Um, so as you can see, this is a well-oiled machine and we've got it all right, right from the start. Um, Alex is late, um, they will be joining us. They are an ENT um, higher surgical trainee and are our publicity lead running the uh, Twitter um, PRISM site. So we've started um, just showing you some slides from out at the college, which was um, our event on the is on inaugural PRISM event on the 25th of March. And it was an amazing day to walk towards the building and see the Progress Pride flag flying from the Royal College of Surgeons of England for the first time ever. And I'm pleased and proud to say that it's been flying again this month um, after the Queen's Jubilee weekend was over. Um, this, as I said, was held on the 25th of March. Um, it was for LGBTQ plus surgeons and allies principally, but we also had those intending to be surgeons and we had from other specialties, particularly from obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, Neil Matenson is president of the Royal College of Surgeons, opened the event um, and we had our own 50 faces um, recording for ASSET. We had, um, and you can see the, many of the committee members in the slideshow here that you're seeing now. We had talks from Dr. Anthony James, who's the um, coup for Pink News, Dr. Mike Farquhar, who's the Rainbow Badge campaign founder. We had Jessica Hallam from Harvard discussing inclusive learning environments, Jamie Bellamy, an orthopedic surgeon in America and founder of Pride Ortho. Um, uh, talk to us at the wonders of the internet and, and Teams meetings. We had round, round table discussions and lots of networking. And most of all, we had a safe place where people, uh, the buzz in the room is amazing. Everyone was very happy. It was really lively um, uh, and a lovely day rounded up with some um, wine courtesy of the college in the library. Um, so after the event, I mean, what is PRISM? I think most of you here now will know, today will know that PRISM Pride and Surgery um, uh, Forum started after the four podcasts from on the theatre platform um, a year ago and we came together to form a committee there was a lot of um, reaching out on 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 social media and with emails and, and feeling that this was the time now that we wanted to be heard and have a voice so we formed the committee um, and from that with the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, created the out of the college event um, our aims for PRISM are to have visibility, a voice, role models and networking for LGBTQ plus surgeons and those who want to be surgeons and allies. Um, we want to create safe spaces for the LGBTQ plus community within our profession. We want to create an inclusive profession, be able to um, advise on the correct language that should be used and to change the stereotype that there has been of surgeons. And seeing Charlotte there, um, I see we, we very much welcome dentists as well into PRISM for any that want to be part of it. Um, we're already starting to work with other organisations within surgery, but the really exciting news that we can announce tonight is that as part of the LGBTQ plus response with the Kennedy Report, the Royal College of Surgeons have now taken us into their network um, and we can, I'm very happy we can say we are the Royal College of Surgeons of England Pride um, in Surgery Forum, which means we will have a hub on their website um, and we will be able to attend events with them such as the Future of Surgery, Asset Bota. Um, and are currently now 
looking to um, create out at the College 23, which will be in June next year, uh, and we're hoping that it will be in Manchester. Um, so there's lots of exciting things happen, and we're starting, and, and, and I think um, it, it just feels like the whole culture in surgery is changing to be much more inclusive, and we're really pleased to be part of that. Thank you. I think I'm handing over to you, Karen. And we've welcomed Alex. Alex has joined us now. Hello, Alex. Thank you, Ginny. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to speak to everyone today on this webinar. Um, I am one of the founding members of PRISM, and today I'll be speaking to you about language um, within gender and gender identity and gender spectrums. So um, I've introduced myself earlier. My name is um, Mix Karen Trey. My pronouns are she and they, and I am an SD4 or theory registrar in London. And so I wanted to give you, give you a bit about a talk about a, an article that I wrote for the Arsenal Bulletin and kind of the story that kind of drove me to um, write this article. So since becoming a registrar, I've often had colleagues discuss referrals with me on the telephone. And often when after the referral, they would speak to me and ask me for my name. And more often than you believe, when people ask me for my name and I tell them that it's Karen, the other person on the line will say, thank you, Mr. Karen, or refer to me as sir. And this, this common misunderstanding me, of me is related, I believe, to the assumption that people often make that orthopedic registrars are male. Personally, I'm not offended by being misgendered as, uh, as Mr., but the regular misgendering of me and the emphasis of using Miss and Mr. titles did get me thinking about how the current titles that we use for surgery within the UK are based on the gender binary of cisgender men and women. This lack of gender neutral titles in surgery therefore prompted me to write an article for the RCS Bulletin exploring the origins of Miss and Mr. titles in the surgery within the UK. I discuss how these titles are exclusionary to transgender and gender diverse people and who do not identify with the gender binary and use gender neutral pronouns. I also encourage our profession to consider using more gender inclusive language moving forward and offer MIX as a gender neutral honorific title, which I use myself, and I suggest this title for surgeons who do not want to, who do not wish to use Miss and Mr. titles. So this was all happening around the same time as reflecting on my own gender identity. And since understanding more about the gender spectrum and the language used to express these ideas, my understanding of my own gender identity has changed. I now have different ways of talking about myself and communicating to others about how I perceive myself. I identify as a genderqueer woman and I use she and they pronouns interchangeably. I use they pronouns as I feel my gender identity lies along the spectrum of both masculinity and femininity. And I also use she pronouns as I, use, as I feel my gender expression tends to be more feminine and my, many of my lived experiences that have shaped me as who I am has been as a woman. And so as I began to identify as genderqueer, neither Miss or Mr. Fratroy, right, and now hence I use Mix as my title, as I felt more aligned with my identity. Today, when I talk about language of, of gender from my perspective, it is only one view of what it means to be genderqueer. And I want to emphasize that it is by no means representative of the broad experiences of transgender and gender diverse people. So in 2020, the UK census found that 3.1% of the UK population identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. The National LGBT Survey in 2017 found that 13% of respondents um, were transgender and 6.9% identified as non-binary. So assuming and hoping that our profession reflects the demographics and the population that we serve, it is likely that there are individuals within surgery who do not identify with the traditional gender binary and would use gender neutral pronouns. A study that was published by the Pew Research Center in 2021 found that 26% of Americans knew someone who uses gender neutral pronouns. These gender neutral pronouns include they and them, and less commonly in the UK, Z and Zer. Some people also use multiple pronouns, such as myself. I use she and they, and some people use he, they, or they, she. For individuals who do not identify with their assigned gender at birth, being referred to by one's preferred gender is crucial. A study by the Trevor Project, published in the Journal of Adolescent Health in 2020, found that transgender and non-binary youth were two and a half times as likely to experience depressive symptoms, seriously consider suicide or attempt suicide compared to their cisgender LGBTQ peers. Using the correct pronouns and titles can have a profound impact on the well-being and psychological safety of transgender and gender diverse people. 
referring to one by their preferred pronoun affirms one's identity and makes the individual feel seen. And they go from feeling unwelcomed in a cisgender heteronormative society to feeling accepted and included. A study by Perales published in the American Journal of Public Health demonstrated a significant positive association between the use of gender inclusive language in the workplace and the well being of more than 400 trans and gender diverse people. For cisgender people, we need to recognize the unique experiences of transgender and gender diverse people as our colleagues and as our patients and how, learn how best to support them. And one way of supporting them is through the mindful and intentional use of language, pronouns and titles that affirms and empowers them. So moving forward, how can we start bringing this new language into our day to day use? It is widely agreed that learning a new language generally involves mastering four aspects which is speaking, writing, listening, and reading. And today I offer some tips to, for you to try to start using this new language to support our transgender and gender diverse colleagues and patients. So the first aspect of learning a new language is speaking. We can normalize the sharing of gender pronouns by actively sharing your own during introductions, and inviting others to share theirs if they feel comfortable to. For example, my name is Karen, my pronouns are she, they, what are yours? We can also ask transgender and gender diverse people what pronouns they want to use and when. If you get it wrong, apologize, but try not to over apologize. Sharing and asking for pronouns communicates to others around you your awareness and consideration of gender diversity. It tells others that you're not making assumptions about gender and by extension, not making assumptions about other characteristics such as race, class and disability. You can also speak up if someone uses the wrong pronoun for a colleague. Speak to your colleague and ask them how you can support them if someone misgenders them or uses the wrong pronoun. Ask if they want you to correct them at the time or afterwards or at all. Speak to your colleague and ask what makes them feel comfortable and safe. If you hear people making derogatory or transphobic comments about transgender and trans gender diverse people, consider speaking up if you feel safe to do so. Transgender and gender diverse people should not be the ones to shoulder all the burden to drive change and educate others. If you are cisgender, Use your cis privilege to speak up and challenge discriminatory behaviors and be an ally. Use these opportunities to educate others. You can share your knowledge about gender identities and pronouns with your colleagues so they too can help develop their understanding. Some people may not know any transgender or gender diverse people and may not intend to hurt people. So you can help them and understand by understanding the impact of their language. So the second aspect of learning a new language is writing. You can consider writing your pronouns in your email signature, Twitter bio, or name badges. Including pronouns and email signatures can be an important way of communicating one's agenda identity and avoids them being misgendered. For cisgender people in the room, if your gender aligns with the ones you were assigned at birth and you've never questioned your gender, including your pronoun in your email may seem odd or unnecessary. However, including pronouns is a way of showing inclusivity and your awareness of different gender identities and pronouns. It shows your support for transgender and gender diverse people and encourages us to challenge the assumptions we often make of people's gender. However, I must emphasize that including pronouns should not be mandatory. We can encourage people to do so, but it should always be the person's choice. We should also be mindful that some people may still be in the process of trying to figure out who they are and do not feel ready to come out or announce their pronouns. If we force people to write their pronouns when they are not ready we put them in a very difficult position to either lie or out themselves. We can also aim to use more gender inclusive language in our written communication, such as emails, policies, websites, or recruitment ads. For example, instead of addressing groups with dear ladies and gentlemen or sirs and madams, we can try to use the term dear team or dear colleagues. In the policies that we write, instead of using he, she, we can use gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, and instead of referring to a wife, husband, or a girlfriend and a boyfriend, we can use significant other or partner. These changes in language also breaks down the existing gender biases in surgery that default to the surgeon to being male. Gender neutral language is inclusive if you're using it to refer to people in general, or you don't know who may be in the audience. But if someone refers to the significant other as wife or boyfriend, use the words wife or boyfriend as this validates and affirms their relationship. Thirdly, a new aspect of, learning, the aspect of learning a new language is listening. Take your time to listen to our transgender and gender diverse colleagues. 
being part of the LGBTQ community does not mean that our lived experiences are the same. Transgender and gender diverse people have different experiences. So listen to their story and try to understand the challenges that they may have overcome. Listen to what pronouns and titles they want to use and how they want to be supported by you as a friend, colleague, and an ally. You can listen to talks and podcasts of people discussing gender identities and pronouns. Listen to our very own RCS England, the theater podcast, which had launched all of this, the PRISM and Outlet the College, which features Ginny Balbrick and Philippa Burns, one of us, two of our speakers here today. And lastly, the fourth aspect of learning a new language is reading. Expand your understanding of the spectrum of gender identities by reading books and resources online. There's a growing body of research and literature about the experience of LGBTQ people in surgery as patients and as colleagues. If you're on social media, you can follow transgender and gender diverse activists on Twitter and read about their work. Read about their experiences of coming to understand their gender and the process of changing pronouns. One of my personal favorite books is We Can Do Better Than This, which is a collection of essays by LGBTQ activists around the world. And I found it to be extremely useful and helpful, but which I've also shared with some of my prison members. When we start to use new pronouns, be it they, them, she, they, for ourselves or for others, we must recognize that we are entering a new space of change and understand that change requires time. Learning a new language takes different amounts of time for each of us, which is full of ups and downs. We will make mistakes and we'll be scared of hurting each other's feelings or embarrassing ourselves in front of others if we use the wrong pronouns. If you see yourself as an open and accepting liberal person, the fear of misgendering and coming across as ignorant threatens this self-perception of you. But Trying and messing up is better than not trying at all. The discomfort of not getting it right every time is an important part of the learning process. Acknowledging and accepting this and dedicating yourself to trying is the only way we can move forward. I can honestly say as a genderqueer woman, I still don't always get it right myself. I have accidentally used the wrong pronouns. But if you make a mistake, don't get, don't get offensive, apologize and be conscious of your language moving forward. Language around gender is constantly evolving and we're all on this journey of learning together. Sharing pronouns, using gender inclusive language and using the correct pronouns invites authenticity and shows inclusivity. Challenging our own use of language around gender also challenges our assumptions of other personal characteristics such as race, sexual orientation and disability. Together we can build a community in which transgender and gender diverse people, individuals on the LGBTQ spectrum who is safe, respected, and welcome in surgery, and can thrive as their true authentic selves. So thank you for being on this journey together with me. Thank you. Um, I think Philip. Yes, it's me up now. Uh, my name's Philip Burns. I'm a vascular surgeon in Edinburgh. I'm sorry for the messy office. I share it with somebody and uh, they're far less tidy than I am. Promise, it's not my mess. I came out as trans four years ago. I was well into my consultant career, being consultant nine years. I know you're all thinking, no, she's not that old, but it's true. Uh, and, and actually, I, I was very lucky. I had the support of my wife, my children, but there were certain things that I knew would be difficult and I was nervous about. Uh, and they're the things that I spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to prepare for, such as telling my colleagues, uh, telling my friends and extended family. I was worried about how my interactions with patients would go, especially the ones that I'd known for a long time. And of course, I was worried about the minefield that was changing rooms. But and I suppose it's a bit like vascular surgery. It's the things that you don't prepare for, don't anticipate, I think that'll be fine, that actually catch you out. And, and, and a few things really came from left field. And following on from Karen's talk, it does look like we're a well-oiled machine, doesn't it? One thing that I took time to get used to was my new name and pronouns. I'd had 47 years of getting used to my old name and pronouns. And although I wasn't in any doubt about transitioning, I spent a lot of time preparing for it and, and trying to make sure I was, I was ready for it. It does take time to get used to responding to a different name. 
And literally day one as Philippa at my work, standing in the foyer of the hospital, and a very well-meaning colleague who I know very well was on the other side of the foyer, shouting my name, Philippa, Philippa, obviously quite pleased with herself that she's doing the right thing and got the correct name. And I was completely oblivious to it. And I thought, gosh, there's, there she is. She's shouting on somebody else called Philippa before the penny dropped. And that was me. So it does take time to get used to these things. Uh, like a teenager, I had to practice my new signature because you just do automatically. It's like tying your tie or tying your shoelaces. The signature is the same. And I had to sit at home writing my new signature from change it from one illegible scrawl to another. And what was sort of funny or ironic was I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could tell anyone. I thought if I told somebody that I was getting this wrong or I wasn't used to it, it would make me feel like, or make me look like I wasn't trans enough. I was asking all these people to accept me as a, as a woman who four weeks ago I'd been a man, but they might sort of think I wasn't prepared enough or I was doubting it if I was struggling with my new name or pronouns. And even to this day, four years down the line, I still get a little thrill when people refer to me as she or her. So it is important, but as Karen said, it does take time to get used to. The other thing that I hadn't anticipated was how isolated I would feel. I was the epitome of privilege. I'd grown up as a white cis male, and in surgery, that's who you're surrounded by. And certainly when I was growing up, uh, you know, the, I could look around and the people that I wanted, I thought I wanted to be, you know, they were all around me. There was teachers at school, there were white cis heterosexual football players and rugby players. When I started medical training, I thought I went through surgery. Then role models were all around me. And then as I start to work things out in my own head, I realize actually, do you know what, I'm maybe not fitting into this little neat box that I thought I was. I realized that, you know, what I was feeling was and the feelings could be explained by the fact I was transgender. I suddenly looked around and there was nobody like me. There were no couples that looked like me and my wife, what I hoped it would be like. And it felt quite isolating. And people might dismiss this, but that, this was very new to me. I'd, I'd grown up expecting to be the norm and all of a sudden I wasn't. I was aware of two surgeons who were transgender, but they were very distant. They're almost like celebrities. And there's really nobody around me that I could find that I related to. I thought I might solve it by going to some trans support groups, but unfortunately all, all I found there were people whose only thing they had in common with me was that they were trans. And I came away from them actually feeling really quite despondent. Uh, and I remember saying to Hazel, where, where are all the people that are actually just getting on with their life making a success of their lives. They might be transgender, but that's not how they solely define themselves. And uh, who are the, who are the transgender folk who are, who are making success of things? And quite clearly in retrospect, it's obvious they are not going to a support group on a Saturday afternoon. They're off shopping and doing things, but that wasn't a solution for me. But as with many things in my life, I may have fallen in a barrel of poop at times, I did manage to come out smelling of roses and this happened at a gender clinic appointment. I was pouring out my heart to my consultant, explaining my woes that there was nobody like me. And she said, well, do you know, just by coincidence, my next patient who's in the waiting room just now, I suspect, also works at your hospital. Are you happy to meet them? And of course, I was delighted. You know, this is like fantastic. Uh, and she said, well, if you're if you're happy, I'll go and check if they're happy and then you two can meet and say hi and, and you know, exchange details. So she left. My heart is now beating 19 to the dozen, wondering who on earth is going to come through this door? It's like, you know, stars in your eyes. You know, there's somebody in my hospital who's transgender who I don't know about. Is this going to be the person I share an office with? It wasn't. 
is it going to be the very butch, very aggressive medical director who's told me off on numerous occasions, or is it somebody else? And actually, she came to the door with somebody that I didn't know, but who worked in a department that, as a vascular surgeon, we work with on a daily basis. And I practically fell into their arms. <laughs> I think she was probably a bit disconcerted. She's this needy person. And, uh, and they became a really close friend and a really close source of support for me. Uh, and actually, what was also very reassuring about that was this person had transitioned in the hospital about six months before. They were in a department that I work with on a daily basis. And that, that change had not reached my radar. And I was very pleasantly surprised that there was no earthquakes in the hospital when this person had transitioned. The hospital wasn't full of gossip, and this has gone without a great deal of, of disruption. So that was very reassuring. And at last, I'd seen somebody who was a bit like me. And the final thing that had caught me unaware is that I, I hadn't anticipated. And again, this comes back to something that Karen has mentioned was loss of privilege. Now, I'm going to tread carefully here. I am not the postal girl for loss of privilege. I'm a consultant, I've got a good job, I've got supportive colleagues, a fabulous family, but there are things that I was taking for granted that I don't have now. And it's the ability to talk about your partner freely. And many of you might relate to this, but just as an example, just last week, my wife Hazel was chatting to a, a colleague of hers in the staff room at the school she works at. And they were discussing what they'd done at the weekend. And her partner, her friend had said, well, we went away to so-and-so. And he said, wow, me and my wife, we were in the lakes at the weekend. And her colleague, who didn't know Hazel that well, obviously thought she was doing the right thing, and was appeared interested and said, oh, wow, your, your wife. And Hazel, who's not shy, said, yes, yes. And her colleague said, well, OK, uh, how long have you been married? Hazel, Hazel said, well, 25 years. And the frown deepened on her colleague's brow and said, uh, oh, uh, right, uh, well, gosh, uh, what, was it legal then? And that must have been difficult. And Hazel, at this point, has got two options. She can carry on as she wants to, talking about her trip to the Lake District, or she can then spend the rest of her break explaining, well, no, 25 years ago, it wasn't Philippa, she was a man, and we got married as that, and we had our six children, but you don't want to go down that rabbit hole every break. And in retrospect, I've had numerous conversations in theatre with other colleagues who are LGBTQ, and, and they are unable to participate fully in that conversation. And that's a, that's a privilege that, uh, that most people who are straight don't have to think about. They don't have to negotiate the linguistic gymnastics that, that I do and my wife does now. So there are a number of things that are more difficult uh, because you're not straight. Now, some things I think uh, are clearly not going to change. Worrying about changing rooms, getting used to pronouns and your new name. But I really hope that events like this, events like out at the college and, and groups such as PRISM and the college taking us under the wing, hopefully in years to come, will make it easier and will open surgery out to beyond a narrow group of people who traditionally have been attracted to speciality. So thank you very much for giving me another 10, 15 minutes to talk about myself, which everyone loves doing. Uh, I think we're over to Alex. Hi, uh, my name's Alex Ashman. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and I use doctor for various reasons. Um, for one thing, to try and help with the move towards uh, my female colleagues not having to use gendered pronouns as well and generally it's popular in Australia but it's a choice which obviously we're talking about choices of pronouns choices of of titles 
Um, I have slides, but apologies, um, due to a family emergency, I wasn't able to do the tech tester earlier. Um, I'm going to see if I can get the slides working. If anyone can make the slides work, Alex, you'll yeah, be able to. Oh, yeah, there's something happening. Yeah, amazing. Um, am I ready to share my screen? Yeah. Can you see it yet? Yes. No, I can't see it. <laughs> Oh, here we go. I can see some slides. Can everyone see some slides? Yeah. Amazing. Okay, um, so this is sort of a social media update of sorts, um, which there's not a lot to update because we've only existed on social media for a month and a half, maybe two months if we're being charitable. So this is amazing. It's all very brand new. Um, so let me see if this is going to move along. Yeah, here we go. So at prism underscore surgery, because Twitter's been around for a while, and that's what we went with, uh, we launched in April 2022, that's <laughs> not very long ago. And amazingly now we have over 600 people following us. Um, so many people started following us immediately the moment they realized we existed on Twitter. Um, and even, even though it's still early days, we've had so many enthusiastic messages, lots of support. Um, just the other day, there were some negative reactions to one of the Royal College's um, posts on Facebook and Ginny mentioned it on Twitter and we immediately had such a supportive response and we're so very grateful for that. Um, obviously so very grateful for the Royal College of England um, also giving us so much support and you know proudly flying the flag and everything you know showing that they're not afraid to support us. Um, we've already been quoted officially in Pink News which is a little surreal um, and we've We've had a lot of support and visibility in what are you know, proving to be difficult times at the moment. And we're taking a lot of inspiration from organizations like Pride Ortho and others who've been around for a little while and been doing this for a while, and um, who we had representation out of the college. So we've been learning lessons from others and really we'd love to do a lot more and we're going to uh, talk about that at the end. So this was our sort of first Oh, let, let the slide get to everyone. This is our first really big um, tweet that we had, um, asking everyone to just kind of say hi, um, you know, <laughs> introduce yourself. And um, we, we had a few replies, and then we, we had a few more replies. And then amazingly, we had such a, an amazing response from all the subspecialties from people in, you know, in all stages of training and consultant and SAS doctors and we, we had a lot of a lot of replies a lot of people retweeting it it was an absolutely amazing experience thinking you know if we post a tweet into the void are we actually going to have anyone say anything apart from a few of us you know retweeting it to each other actually no we had such a wonderful response it really feels like we're meeting a need that has yet been unmet previously uh, in the UK in surgery. And it is the sort of, you know, you get the hair stand up on the back of your neck sort of feeling. And um, that one little tweet from our one little account with 600 followers, although fewer at the time we tweeted it, has had a quarter of a million people view it, um, which is just staggering because I don't think there's a quarter of a million surgeons in this country. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's quite amazing. Um, as I mentioned, we've been um, quoted in Pink News. Um, we made a comment on the NHS blocking the provision of healthcare advice to trans and non-binary people. And um, Pink News said, okay, can we put that in our piece? And it's, uh, it's amazing. It's like, what, our little organization? Yes, um, it's absolutely amazing. So we're looking forward to doing more of that. Um, just sort of getting out the fact that we exist and, um, you know. Um, then more recently we've had um, our um, Pride Month campaign, which we have so very, very many more people to include in. Um, and it's amazing how many responses we've had for that. So we're going to promise to get through everyone. Um, and it's, yeah, 
I'll move on from the slide with me on it. We'll go on to the one with uh, Ms. Ms. Rihanna Patel on instead because I've seen my face crop up over social media far too much. Um, but we have so many more wonderful um, LGBTQ plus um, trainees and consultant surgeons, etc., cetera, who um, we're going to showcase. And it's just very exciting, basically. So in terms of the future, um, essentially, we're going to carry on with what we've been doing for um, things like, um, you know, obviously introducing ourselves for Lesbian Visibility Week, for Pride Month. We're going to keep on repeatedly, unashamedly, keep on saying, look, we are here and this is us and we are surgeons and we are multifaceted people and we are, you know, we need your help. We want you to come and be allies. We want to make a big deal of this and we are not going away. And you know, show, show, you know, pride in surgery. <laughs> um, going forward, we would like to have a website hub with some resources and guidance. We'd like to do some outreach work. Outreach work. Um, we'd like to start providing some links to useful content elsewhere so we don't reinvent the wheel. And ideally, we want to start giving kudos some recommendations for, um, you know, surgical organisations showing good practice. We don't want to duplicate what other organizations like the NHS Rainbow Badge are doing, but we'd love to be able to say, yes, that's a good rotation to work in. Yes, these people are friendly to work with. Yes, you, you will be safe being who you are um, and moving towards that in the future. Um, so I will unshare my slides now. Okay. Stop sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have opened up um, the chat and there's been some very nice comments coming through. But if I could start off, um, the college is committed to making the college a safe, inclusive home for surgeons and dental surgeons. And we're very excited that PRISM um, are making it their home. What, is, what does PRISM mean to you? Um, and what does it mean to you as to have this as part of the Royal, Royal College now? Shall I go first? <laughs> um, for me, I mean, I was lucky that as a consultant coming out, being out at work um, wasn't a big drama, wasn't a problem. But I'm aware that I've had many trainees who, because I am openly gay, have felt happy to talk to me. Um, and up until that point, they've hidden it. Um, and it's the same as, as Philippa and Karen were saying, you know, watching what they say. And sometimes if you then don't um, discuss what you did at the weekend, people think you're a bit cold or not very interesting or a bit dull and you get left out of all the conversation or you don't feel you can challenge the inappropriate banter that might be going on in theatre because um, then people might work out what, what your orientation is. So for me, it's being there uh, and being visible um, and to be able to allow people who haven't had felt that they could be a surgeon and say they're LGBTQ+, plus, it enables them to be able to do that. And that feels very important to me. Um, being part of the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, is means that, I mean, from the perspective that if surgeons are seen as the most difficult nut to crack, so if the Royal College of Surgeons of England can fly the Progress Pride flag and support this, then there's no reason why all the other colleges and other parts of the medical profession as a whole can't be more inclusive. Um, and um, I'm really excited about what's coming for the future, not just the next event, but all the work that we're going to do in, in making surgery as a profession more inclusive, a safe space for people to be their true selves within it. Um, and therefore, you know, we'll have the better profession by the fact that we can choose from the whole of the po population of surgeons rather than just one stereotypical group. And that's better for our patients, because after all, this is for our patients. Um, at the end of the day, we can reflect the population that we look after. So those who are LGBTQ plus will feel more comfortable and they'll have the best surgeons that are possible to um, recruit in the profession. Thank you. Any other comments? Philippa. Yeah, I mean, slightly expanding on that, my daughter's a medical student and, and the talk among medical students is that, yeah, I think surgery still has a bit of an image problem. And I think what PRISM does or can do is say, look, we are not who you think we are. You know, where that image of Sir Lancelot Spratt is is gone. Uh, you know, we are we are accepting and diverse 
and and things have moved on and I think that's the best thing about PRISM is the is the outreach we can do to those that are coming in as Jenny said to cast our net as wide as possible to get the best people possible into surgery. I totally agree. Any, any other comments Alex? No? Yeah? Um, I think when, when you're a trainee and when you don't fit the sort of weird toxic masculine role in surgery and also if you're not straight you get three different strikes against you in surgical training and that means you're not in a position of sort of um, not in a robust position to be who you are and having it just even having the lanyard with a little Royal College of Surgery thing and logo on it with a rainbow on and wearing that around thinking you know actually the organization has my back and you know it's not you know it's not wrong to be LGBTQ in surgery it's not something that is you know outlandish and people can speak up against and say no you can't be this um so knowing that the college has your back and knowing that you know it is things are going to change just means a lot emotionally and in terms of you know the sort of feeling of safety and the ability to be visible which you know sort of from an emotional point of view is a lot absolutely and the college is very committed um to this and they're We've had meetings recently because you're joining us and everybody is so excited that PRISM is going to be part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, I mean, are there things that you would want to see as the college as doing to support you more than just in, incorporating PRISM into the Royal College? What would be the things that would be top of your list of things that we could do to support? Ginny? I think that apart from everyone having the um, access to the Royal College of Surgeons rainbow lanyards, which are particularly fabulous and were very popular out at the college, um, that we reflect on the language that we use, particularly we can start very easily with, I had a form from an association that's not the Royal College of Surgeons of England, but it came as gender was um, male, female or other. Um, and I did contact them and say, this is offensive um, and we need to rethink it. Um, and it's just being able to change the language that we use um, when you're registering for something or, or you're putting something, the language or what your um, sexual orientation may be or your gender. They're small things that we can do and we can advise on. So I'd like to see that sort of change um, uh, with that. And any sort of any, and we've already spoken about what we can attend with the Royal College of Surgeons to, to help such as future surgery. So I feel it's just as far as we can throw, we can be and our reach and to reach as many people. And that's um, for allyship as well um, and to make small changes. And then from that, larger changes will come. Certainly the, the Royal College are very keen on mentoring and I think it's important that in the mentoring schemes that, that we're getting a, a, a broad range of individuals who are able to mentor people in the way they want to be mentored. Um, I think we do have questions coming in now. I think Jane is about to the relationship to the mentorship, we have um, a PRISM um, committee member, Mark Bagnall, who's joining um, the committee at the Royal College of Surgeons on Mentorship as the PRISM um, representative for LGBTQ plus surgeons. Um, but even when you look at things like the parents in surgery, you know, it's we can participate in helping with that and the language and the issues. Um, so when I became, when, when my wife was pregnant, we had our, our child who's, who's two years old, going along to human resources and asking for the form so I could have time off. I had to fill in a paternity leave form because they didn't have any other form for me to fill in. And it's these small things that make such a difference. I mean, I took it on the chin and laughed about it, but actually I had every right to be upset. Uh, and it's it's working within all of that as to how we can um, can help with all the other committees uh, that, that, that the Royal College of Surgeons of England hosts to, to, to advise on those sort of those LGBTQ plus specific issues. Absolutely. Jane, do you have some questions? We do have some questions. Thank you all for your um, talks. Um, we also have some congratulations. So Tamsin Cummins, who is our chair of the Women in Surgery Network, is, um, is watching. So a little shout out to Tamsin, who is just sending her good wishes and congratulations to the college for having welcomed PRISM and PRISM for being part of the college. So thank you. Um, so we've got a question which I suspect we don't know the answer to, which is always a good place to start. Are there any statistics on how many LGBTQ plus surgeons there are compared to the general population? 
<laughs> I guess um, it, it, that's an interesting point because we're saying that we don't know this, the statistics, but ideally as a healthcare profession, we should be reflecting our population exactly to be able to best treat our population. So ideally, I like to hope that well, with the census quote, the 3.1%, but it probably is lower because we know about the, the barriers for um, LGBTQ communities into um, accessing you know, surgery, um, going into medicine, but also being uh, afraid to come into surgery as a profession because of the negative stereotypes that is associated with being surgeons. So, and we probably don't know, but that's probably part of the work that we would be able to do with um, RCS England is to understand a bit more about the um, the community within the profession because I feel like the one of the most powerful things about Prism is that we are now we are now visible. We are not just invisible people dotted around doing our jobs. We are actually here. We make a difference and we contribute a lot. I think that recognition um, is really important. So um, it's a, it's a first step that we can do with the college is to understand a bit more about what the current climate is looking like. Thank you. Any other comments? And um, Philippa? Uh, yes, uh, so to be fair, the College in Edinburgh, I don't know if that's a bad word to say on this webinar, uh, <laughs> did have a questionnaire recently that I filled in and there was quite a lot of questions about your gender identity and your sexuality and it was anonymous. So I think it's very important we get some data. I mean, it's not all about targets, but unless we know where we are now, we will not know if surgery is doing the right thing or not by improving its proportion of people who are LGBTQ+. So I think it's very important that we get some some decent data and at least start from there. And it, you know, it tends to happen once you've got some data and you realise how poorly you're performing, it does tend to focus minds a bit. Uh, I know targets aren't for everything, but I think it'll at least be a start. Ginny? I've got a feeling, Philippa, that another prison committee member had a hand in what was on that form. I think Chloe Scott did. Um, from, we, there was a paper that, that Greta McLachlan quoted um, at the, the out at the college from America, and that's the nearest we can get to these figures. And I think it was 5% of residents identified as LGBTQ+. So if you take in this age group, this range age group where it's 10% uh, plus of the population identify as LGBTQ+, although I mean, um, it's quite a large spectrum, but we can see that there was underrepresentation in America. So we probably see the same amongst surgeons in in um, the UK, but we just don't know. Um, and I know that the college have got as part of their response to the Kennedy report some research fellowships, which were I don't know if they're still open now. They were being discussed when we had the out at the college. But this I would hope would form part of that research. Um, within these fellowships to actually look and see if we can identify what the percentage and what the numbers are, because we just don't know. Um, Alex. Now, there's a wonderful talk um, by Greta from out at the college where she's gone through the research that exists and you can get through all of it in slides in about 10 minutes. And but one thing I wanted to highlight is um, the British Orthopaedic Association found that LGBTQ plus surgeons we're at high risk of burnout during training and also on completion of training. And then the US general surgeons, uh, similarly they found that residents were twice as likely to drop out of the programme and also because of mistreatment, twice as likely to consider suicide, although that effect was removed once the mistreatment was taken out of the equation. So there are real needs to um, look at the numbers and see what's going on in the UK. Um, to a further extent and also see what the effects are on LGBTQ plus um, trainees, SAS, doctors and consultants. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a couple more coming through. Um, so this is one specifically for Karen about pronouns. Um, compliment to your talk, I find it very interesting. Is there another way to describe this without using the term pronouns outside of surgery the wider community don't necessarily understand the sort of grammatical terms and I think this so this is from one of our patient reps so I guess she's talking predominantly from a patient point of view sorry so is the question about from a patient's perspective How she hasn't specified that um, but she said the question is is there another 
way of describing pronouns and talking about pronouns without the word pronouns because it isn't necessarily used by general public I mean in surgery I think most of your colleagues are probably aware of what you're talking about but you wouldn't necessarily expect that from all of your patients or the wider community um, Sorry. You can have you a few can minutes the, word, the word pronoun the, uh, the, yeah. okay I mean if I, I guess it's um it depends on the context of how it comes up is like is the patient asking or um how they should refer to us as or refer to a clinician as or or is just the word itself pronoun and what that means to I th people i think in it's what what people understand by pronouns because i think when we're oh. dealing with our sort of medical colleagues most people mm -hmm. would understand what pronoun is but i guess outside of medicine right um, i think it we're so used to the fact that we're, you know, Alex now uses doctor, but with most um, surgeons still feel comfortable to say Mr. or Miss, and that's the patient's expectation. They may be surprised to see a surgeon who's still using the doctor title or using mixed title. Um, mm. And that could be quite surprising. I mean, we've had that debate on Twitter. Should we all go back to being doctor? I'm not a fan. I'm really sorry. I want to stay as I am as, as Miss. Um, and, and a lot of that comes down to those expectations of walking in the room and seeing me as a female surgeon being surprised. So um, as far as pronouns, it may just be whether people want to be she, he, they um, as a connotation for instead of saying pronouns. I don't know. What do you think of that, Karen? Um, I think if that does come up as a, a discussion point between the patient, it's you, you. I guess personally for me, if someone's like, "Oh, I don't know what you mean. Why should I use they? Uh, you are a she." Then I, it, it would involve an opportunity to educate and have a discussion about gender identity and gender spectrum because I guess this goes beyond just our colleagues. I think um, the understanding of gender and its development is you know society wide and so this could be an opportunity to talk about you know gender identity and the spectrum and how this also affects um people who are non-medics but also people who are medics as well um it it really depends how much time you have in the clinic room and how long your consultation is going whether or not you can engage in that conversation um and i can understand how there could be a struggle if someone doesn't quite get how if you present yourself your gender presentation is very feminine and you're saying i use they pronouns um it might be confusing for them um and uh, personally i haven't encountered such an incident um i usually just just talk about clinical stuff and don't really get into that so i don't know what are the experiences of other people philippa i, I was just going to ask can I how many of the other panellists had success in getting their colleagues to put their pronouns in email signatures? Because I know my colleagues, they're worried that if they put their pronouns in, everyone will think they're not straight. And that's, well, if they're happy to support me, that would be a step too far. And I don't know how people do that, if they've had success with that. I have it in mine and I've tried to encourage some of my colleagues. And I've had some of my colleagues ask me why I do it. Mm -hmm. um, and last year at my trust during the pride month we try we were giving out stickers to put on on badges for everyone and they could put their pronouns on um and there was only a couple of people who refused or said they didn't want to and once it was explained to them what it meant about inclusivity um ultimately the patients i mean hopefully they're so they're coming to see us for their condition and, and not going to worry and, and it, this sort of story reminded me Philippa though of those patients of yours that knew you before you transitioned and then they yes. came to see you and you had a few who who struggled a little bit and some who were absolutely fine mm. yeah most were fine remarkably a few obviously took a bit of time to get around and some still still left the consultation room thinking they've seen something completely different <laughs> Brilliant. So we've had somebody agreeing with Ginny regarding um, doctors' titles. They like the bit of a, the little bit of British history that goes uh, goes with the the switching back. Um, I was just thinking it must be a load of hassle with like credit cards and things like that backwards and forwards. <laughs> but I'm just not a fan of anything that involves that level of effort. <laughs> 
Um, so um, our CEO is online as well, and he has just sent his uh, good wishes and said it's a fantastic webinar. So thank you all. Um, and sorry, I should probably not have told you that he was watching. Um, but the research fellowships have closed. They closed on the 1st of June. So we did have applications. So, so um, I, I look forward to seeing what, um, what comes out of that area of work. Um, how can we get the regional training leads on board with um, raising the profile of LGBT, LGBTQ plus surgeons? Is that as in regional reps? No. The question is regional, tra it says regional training leads. I guess it's, yeah, regional reps. Oh, as in um, TPDs, schools, training program directors. Yeah. 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 Outside, of, I guess the roles that are outside of the college's gift, because regional directors and surgical duties and things would be um, program directors. Let's clarify. Well, I guess as a head of school, I'm one of those regional training leads, um, and I I think that there's a lot of work being done. I've just been asked to go and talk at what was NACT, but is now Medical Leaders um, later in the year, where they're going to have an inclusion event. Um, so there's it's certainly um all happening and all of us have been asked to go and talk and philippa and i were asset and spoke there um and and reaching out to medical schools and various talks so i think that the word is is spreading and we'll be asked to go and talk so that's one way that we can do it i don't know if anyone's got any other thoughts of whether they feel it's not reaching reaching out Philippa. I've not got a lot to add, I suppose. I, th I think just trying to, to be present and, and raise the awareness and, and do little talks like we've done at, at meetings, you know, in between other clinical things. I think it just raises the visibility and will raise the profile of, of PRISM as well, to be honest. But we have spoken as well about going into medical and dental schools to talk to people just to raise the profile of the Royal College and the things that we do and why you should affiliate with the English College as opposed to any others. And I think it's important that we're talking about this sort of thing, inclusion and getting PRISM out there to the dental and medical schools so that people know from the very beginning that it's a very welcoming, inclusive um, family that they could join. Um, and come to England rather than Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was our last formal question. I don't know if anyone. Um... <laughs> Sorry, I've also had comments just uh, my team who were watching, finding that very funny. The excellent plug from Charlotte. <laughs> Definitely join the English College. We're very welcoming. Um, but that was my last formal question, so I'm going to hand back to Charlotte. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anybody have any final comments they would like to make? Um, Ginny. Um, if we could, I mean, I'll start off. But um, I think that so much has happened in the last couple of years. When you, the first sort of thing I saw about Pride a few years ago on Facebook that, that made me want to get involved with all of this and, and then I volunteered to speak to the Kennedy review panel was the post where there were so many angry faces and people laughing about anything at the college supporting Pride and although we had a few um, negative responses there's so many less and you go on social media and actually those people making those sort of homophobic transphobic responses to anything about PRISM or the Royal College of Surgeons doing anything for pride they are the ones that actually rather they think they're going to get lots of support and instead other people are supporting our community um, and that's such a change in how things are and I think that's so encouraging and I think I do feel that that as prison we have been part of that work I feel proud of what we've achieved um, just seeing the Royal College of Surgeons flying the progress pride flag um, made us all quite well made me quite emotional and other people on the day said it did which was surprising so you know there's there is a culture change happening there's still a lot of work to do and we do know what we want to achieve through this um, and it's um, just so it's it's just amazing to be doing these webinars and being part of the Royal College of Surgeons to be able to take this work forward and make the profession much more inclusive and a better place to be. So I'm really grateful to my colleagues on the committee 
um, and to the Royal College of Surgeons of England for facilitating what we can do. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? And Philippa. Uh, I think it's ironic that the safe space on Twitter now for a queer person is among surgery. <laughs> You know, Twitter's just terrible just now. The media is terrible, actually. It's ironic that, that the safe space that we feel we can be ourselves is in surgery. And I think, uh, well done. And I'd like to thank you all for a fantastic evening and for the talks that you've all um, given to us. I think it's incredible listening to some of the stories and appreciating just how some of the very simple things that could be done, like being able to discuss what you did at the weekend could be changed and could make people's lives so much so much better um, and we are so committed um, to making this a very safe and inclusive college um, and we hope to work with you further and if there's anything that we can do then we definitely need to hear about this and we need to hear about it in the faculty of dental surgery as well so that we can bring everybody all our members along with us in this journey thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.